Well, wheat is one of the three major cereals of the world. It's well adapted to many, many different environments. And for this reason, it's become a primary foodstuff for many, many different communities in the world, both in the developing world and in the developed world. Oh, well, I know I'd certainly disagree with that. <laughs> I think wheat is an, an enormously complex cereal, enormously complex genetically. And wheat has many different ancestral species. In fact, wheat itself is a combination of three different species. And at least for two of those, we have significant genetic variation still in the environment, some of it not even collected, much of it in gene banks, much of it uncharacterized in gene banks. So there are potentially all sorts of new gene combinations that may play a role in, in, uh, in providing um, the genetic means to overcome stresses in the future, Fu current stresses and future stresses. So I, I totally disagree. I just don't think we've done a really good job as plant scientists and plant breeders, or the job it, 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 as well as we could have done in utilizing all that diversity. So there's a lot of diversity there, a lot of work to be done, a lot of skills needed. I think that's a, a little more limited. I, I think you, you will find wheat from the equator to 60 degrees north of the equator. It's spread in most of the environments where I think it's possible to grow wheat. Now, where you might spread could be into some of the more tropical environments, but my and, and you can, you can improve the adaptation of wheat in more tropical environments. But the issue is, why would you grow wheat? Why not grow maize or, or some other better adapted cereal? So uh, I think the, the actual spread or adap the current spread of wheat in the world, the current spread of environments is unlikely to change. What we need to do is increase the productivity in those environments. Well, these are two countries that are number one and number two in total wheat production every year. China is the biggest wheat producer, India is the second biggest wheat producer. Wheat, along with rice, uh, is, is, is absolutely vital for food security in these countries. Now, with projected climate change and increasing population, so even without projected climate change, just population pressure itself, is putting enormous pressure on water reserves. And there will be less water in the future for irrigation. And much of the wheat in India and in China is grown with irrigation. Even now, it's getting more difficult to pump the water up from depth to irrigate in the Punjab of India, the bread basket, bread basket of India. So we have to find solutions to this. We need genetic solutions, we need agronomic solutions, and we need economic policy solutions. So it's going to be a combination of things. At least within the GCP and within the research with the wheat research initiative, we can do something about the genetic side of it. And working closely with partners in India and China, uh, we're, 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 we're implementing some new and different schemes and we think that uh, these may well bear fruit in the future. Well, I, I think you're looking at two different types of wheat. In India, they, they grow spring wheat. In China, they grow winter wheat. Now, winter wheat grows over a much longer period of time. It's a much longer cycle. And yields tend to be higher with winter wheat. But nevertheless, uh, if you look at the spring wheat yields in India, in the northwest of India, they're very high. And farmers are, are using good, good agronomic practices and good varieties to get there. But if you go to Eastern India, where it's drier, well, it can be drier, it's more humid, population is actually very large, uh, the agronomic system has not been optimized in the same way. There's tremendous potential there to improve the yield in spring wheat. Well, as I said a little bit earlier, I, I said that we researchers and we plant breeders probably haven't done the job we could. And I'm not saying that people are lazy <laughs> by any means. I think people have worked incredibly hard, but we've not had the knowledge of the genes that control the, 
responses to the stresses. We've not had access to the tools that would allow us to increase our rates of genetic advance. Now with the tremendous advances in molecular biology over the last 10 years, the tools, the molecular tools are there. Problem now is we are dealing with enormous amounts of information. How do we get the best out of that information? This is the great challenge, I think, for plant breeders in the future, now now and in the future. And uh, I believe that the, the platform, the IBP, is going to provide us with those tools to help us take advantage, to, to actually get close to what, to the level of genetic advance that is possible. It's a good question, it's a good question and, and normally, normally you have a problem when people have an existing tool. And it's very hard to get them away from an existing tool. But for most of our partners in India, in China, they don't have legacy database systems for example. So for many of them, the IBP is their first experience of managing data in a coordinated way. So they're not locked into a, a previous system. So I actually think it's easier, people are uptaking it more easily than let's say a scientist in a developed country who has a legacy system that they're used to, they're comfortable with, it, it lacks certain functionalities but they live with it. They're less likely to make the change. So I think this is a great opportunity for people in developing countries to move ahead if you like by adopting these sort of technologies quickly. Well, it's, it's really exciting actually. I think it's one of the great things about the project is that uh, we, we do have scientists from very different backgrounds all working together. Um, they've, they've come from different education systems, they think about problems in different ways, and it's quite interesting when you get a group of people in a room who come from those different backgrounds with those different thoughts and different ways of addressing problems, you can come up with a really good integrated plan. You can come up with things that you have never thought of yourself. And that's the great thing about working in collaborative networks like this. Also, it's been key to find the right partners. And I think in uh, Rulianjing in China, in Vinod Prabhu in India, we've got two fantastic local coordinators and they've pulled together some really, really good networks around the country. Networks of doers, people who are really willing to get in there and, and have a go and make a difference. And it's exciting. And it's been fantastic as an Australian working with uh, working with these teams and we've also taken advantage let me say i mean uh, we have breeding programs in australia and we're using the ibp and we intend to use it more fully as the tools increase and uh yeah i think we we all benefit <laughs>